The Minister of Justice of Russia declared Katerina Gordeeva a foreign agent. June 22nd, 1941, fascists treacherously bombed Kiev. February 24th of this year, fascists treacherously bombed Kiev. Our president offered Russia a game of Russian roulette, but there are six bullets in the revolver, and it's not a game anymore, it's for real. Our people are killing our people, and I can't get my head around it. The minority is usually right, not the majority. And when they listen to the opinion of the minority, this is civilization. But when the majority covers it all, it doesn't determine anything. And uh, these words that people are always right, the public is always right. But what about these people who were destroying churches, ruining bell towers? Were they always right? Obedience of slaves. They take away our rights? Fine. No freedoms? Okay. You can go on rallies, whether they allowed or not? Fine. We ate it all. We were silent. And the Russian people, they're always in this constant puberty period. Maybe this is a mystery of Russian soul, and the pendulum can go, can swing either way. Gary Bardin, film director. How do you feel now? I feel, but feel badly. What helps you not to break down? I would say professional responsibility. I have to make my films, and this is what keeps me going, but it's difficult. I'm going through certain resistance. Many of your colleagues make an excuse that they need to uh, finish their work, film or show. They refused to have an interview with me, particularly because I'm a foreign agent. But when I called you up, you had no doubt even for a second. Don't you kind of compare things, kind of prioritize this type of film you need to finish and here is the interview. But hey, Katerina, will you visit me in prison? I hope so. So then that's it. I couldn't refuse you because I know you for a long time. I know you as a good person. But that, there are not so many left. Many of them went away, went abroad. That's why I had no hesitations. But do you have fear? Your studio, work, life? Yes, of course I do. My son, I am concerned about him. But I must, I must for myself. I, sh I must be courageous. I cannot be a coward. If I'm a coward at 81, it's bad. You were born in 1941. Do you have uh, your childhood memories or war memories? Well, first of all, my mother told me she was pregnant with me, and I have this picture, and I think uh, this is uh, the scariest picture. This is uh, my mother at Krasnoarmeyska Street uh, near the park, and she's standing there uh, holding a railing around the park, and she has this uh, coat on, uh, and you can see her belly, and blue sky, and when you look at the back of the picture, there is a date there, June 21st, 1941, and next day the fascists were bombing the nearby forest. Sometime later I was like this and then like that, in my work, I love Ronda form, this musical form, when action starts and where it ends, and like in Pushkin's fairy tale, where an old woman ends up with a broken trough. So when I have this Rondo, but it's not a piece of art, but I have it in life. My life started on the 11th of September, and on the 19th of September we left, and on the 19th of September Babi Yar massacre started. 
On the 22nd of June, fascists were treacherously bombing Kyiv. On 24th of February of this year, fascists were treacherously bombing Kyiv. And this rondo that I had, my life started with the war. And I'm afraid of saying that my life is ending with it, but my life is ending. So am I doomed to start with the war and to end with the war? All the events, all the recent events, the draft that they declared, to me it's like this, uh, there is such a game and I'm not into all these extreme games, but I think even Mayakovsky played this game, it's a Russian roulette, when in the revolver there is only one bullet, and it's supposed to be six of them, and you spin the revolver, and you put it right straight to your temple, pull the trigger, it just clicks, and you're lucky, right? Our president offered Russia a game of Russian roulette, but there are six bullets in the revolver, and that's scary. It's not a game, it's for real. I'm from Kyiv, uh, my sister lives in Kyiv, and every evening I call her up and ask uh, how many air raid alarms they had, and it's, you know, it's very close to me, and I, I can't go to Kyiv, no transportation, my parents were buried in Kyiv. For me it's a horrible time now. When you talk to your Kiev sister, what do you tell her? What can I tell? I'm trying to comfort her. She's younger than I am, but she's much sicker. Uh, there is a bomb shelter in her building, but it's quite inconvenient there. She can't uh, sit. For her it's easier to lie down, but there is no place there to lie down. That's why she doesn't go to the bomb shelter, convincing me that it's easier for her to die in her own apartment, and I cannot convince her otherwise. It's impossible. This is my pain that I live with. Our people are shooting at our people. I can't get my head around it. Gary Bardin, film director. How did your day go? No air raid alarms? Uh, our people are fighting. So, our people. Your people, our people. Okay. Not your people, but our people. Okay, good. We'll have some tea. Okay. Have tea and hopefully everything will be okay. Bless you and good night. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye bye. Your childhood. It had to do with evacuation. Where did you go? We went to Magnitogorsk. Uh, uh, my uh, grandfather was a shoemaker and, uh, and my father was a shoemaker and uh, he, they had a perfect pitch and they sent in synagogue and I have a perfect pitch and for the first time my grandfather didn't work and uh, they were uh, going on the train he opened the door of the car and sat on the edge of the car with his bare feet dangling outside the door. And he was saying to her, it's good, it's good, it's good, Masha. It was my grandmother's name. And he didn't know that maybe months later his son-in-law will die in the war. A husband of my aunt. And then his son, my uncle Borya, will be injured near Leningrad. But so far he felt good and they managed to escape Babi Yar massacre. But 18 members of uh, my grandmother's family, they stayed there forever. They didn't manage to escape. 
but we were going straight to Magnitogorsk, and I was already about to be born, and I, I didn't know where I was going to be born. And, as Pushkin used to say, with my talent and wit, I was born in Russia, and I was born in Orenburg. And I'm very grateful to this city that gave me shelter, shelter to my family, and we managed to uh, live there. We lived there for three years. What, your personal memory, what was it, first one? I remember uh, my father, when he had three days off after Stalingrad. Your father was a Marine, right? Yes, he was a Marine. Uh, the Marines uh, that were storming Stalingrad, and they used to call him uh, the Black Rebel. They uh, fought furiously. And before the New Year's, it was 1943, my father came to us, to Arenburg, and I remember how he was uh, making me speak, and I was two years old and I could speak, but I couldn't say dad, dada, I, I used to call him uncle, and he said he's not gonna uh, lift me in his arms until I say uh, dad, and I had to say that. So, and then I remember this smell, it was almost like an analeptic uh, sensation. He smoked cigarettes without filter and that smell and when he was carrying me in his arms, I can't identify this I smell anywhere. So he is carrying me in his arms through the center of Arenburg. It was Christmas tree in there and around it there were animals cut of plywood. And from the speakers, I heard the music. I remember that music. And it was a march from Aida opera, as it turned out later, then I learned later. But I remember that very well. So this march from Aida, my father's cigarette smell, and I'm in his arms. This is my memory. And the most horrifying part was we lived on the third floor uh, on Sovetskaya Street. It's the very edge of the city. And then Ural Mountains and Asia. So in other words, I was still born in Europe. And we had a short term training courses for tank crews. Uh, they were trained for three months and sent to the front. And for me, my music memory kind of cemented this, uh, the, the song the Holy War, and they were leaving the city with this song. And every time I hear the song, I have this goosebumps, because I remember seeing those tank crews leaving this, uh, the city and the song, and they're kind of blended all together. And I'll remember it till my dying day. This is a genius song. Do you remember how you learned about the victory? We lived in barracks, and my father was uh, uh, located to Engels town, and there were two barracks, uh, 28 rooms in each of them. Uh, we were always hungry. And I remember, as the first rank captain uh, came to our room, uh, I still remember his name, his name was Kolobov, he was a huge man, and he had the orderly officer with him, and he had a tray and a bottle of vodka and shots on the tray, and he would go to each room, and because he was so huge, he managed to go through all two barracks, 56 rooms. He drank 56 shots, and he drank with each officer to the victory. And I had this feeling of enormity of that captain and the enormity of the event, because his head was almost touching the ceiling where we had the, this black speaker of the radio, where every morning we heard last news. He was, he was huge. 
And it was victory. Is it true that the main drama of uh, the generation of 1960s, that everybody thought that after the war the country will be living a completely different life, that there won't be Stalin, no lies, uh, no isolation, no repressions, and it didn't happen, it didn't happen. Let me tell you this. We had euphoria, but euphoria wasn't as boiling as it was during uh, Perestroika. I would say it was pretty mild. And when they had the uh, 20th Congress of the Communist Party, and I was kind of a seasoned guy, uh, I learned something, I read about something, and I said to my father, but my father was very concerned about it because he believed in Stalin. And in 1942, when he was fighting near Stalingrad, uh, he uh, became a member of the Communist Party. And this Communist Party later kind of ruined him uh, because he was at the party meeting and he had a stroke because he was very nervous back then. But now it's the 20th Congress of the Communist Party. And I was trying to kind of protect him from this. And I told him, Father, Stalin, whatever Stalin, you know, it's just nothing. Lenin, that was really something. And he said, have mercy on me. Let me figure it out with Stalin first, he said. And I never uh, bugged him again. For him, uh, it, it was a collapse, destruction of his face, of his mythology. 1960s, it was our youth, uh, Mayakovsky Square, Sovremanic Theater with its shows, reading poetry, it was a feeling of freshness, uh, something new, and we were completely convinced that it will go on like this. Who could have thought that all of that will fade? gets rotten and will be this stale bubbling swamp. At what point it turned into this bubbling swamp? New life, new people, young people who want to live a different life, new life, if all of them didn't keep silent and they didn't compromise, things would work out, what do you think? But let me tell you this, when Andrei Sinyavsky, our teacher in the, the Moscow Art Theatre School, when he was arrested, then they arrested us, students, who went to defend him. That was, I'd say, the first protest of students, and it uh, ended badly. Uh, Sophia, right? Yeah, and we never repeated it. So they forced us underground. And I would say it was quite soft if we compare it with what's going on today. It was kind of merciful. But now, when gradually they take away your rights, they take away the Constitution, uh, they take away the freedom of speech, it doesn't exist anymore. So for us it became kind of common thing. When we got used to it, we missed certain things. Yes, we used to go to rallies. I went to the rallies with my son, and my son was growing with us. And I remember when there was a huge meeting, it was uh, almost like a million people uh, on February 4th, 1990, uh, when they were rallying against uh, the sixth article of the Constitution of the USSR. And I told my son, look at these people, beautiful faces. We had it in our life. We experienced it but it shrank and we let pull us into this and our obedience should be condemned so they take away our rights whatever no freedoms fine somehow we'll go on you can't go on rallies whether they're allowed or not whatever we ate it all Uh, 
Russian people can be swung either way to good or bad. Russians can give away everything they have, like it happened after the earthquake in Armenia. They can give all the money they have to the operation of a sick boy or a girl, but uh, these people are very kind. But the Russian people can be swan to completely different direction and they become beasts and it's a completely different side of their soul and maybe this is uh, the mystery of Russian soul and the pendulum can swing either way. Now it's swung to a completely different direction. When you hear all this rebuking uh, Russian people and uh, that the Russians uh, don't protest for real against the war and they don't dethrone the authorities, what do you think about it? When I go on a cab and I always uh, talk to the drivers and we have like a small rally in the car and when I you know, learn what the driver is and the different people, and I always listen to their opinion. I'm trying to convince them, uh, and but they tell me, oh, we were attacked by them, and who attacked us? So we attacked them. And they say to me, so they were preparing for us, they had all these c concrete fortifications, and, and so, and, and I tell them, so think what you're talking about. So if they had the fortifications, so they're getting ready for defense. That's that's what they were doing, well, there's logic. But, you know, these people, they turn off uh, their head, uh, they believe what they hear in uh, on TV. And this is dehumanization of people, I say. I'd say that our people are going through a certain puberty period, and during this period, children don't listen to their parents, they listen to all this scum on the streets that uh, push uh, them uh, whom to bully, uh, whom to beat. And it turned out uh, this influence of uh, TV was absolutely killing. And this dehumanization that we see now is absolutely crazy. And when we see that this happening in even in uh, kindergartens, they militarize uh, the kids. And I remember that my wife called my grandson, Misha, and he said, I, I can't talk, he said, because I'm marching. And his other grandmother, she kind of militarized him. And when then I heard from my grandson that he said, you know, Stalin is a tyrant, but then he had... Uh, good things and uh, he had all these words of his other uh, grandma and it's like Dnipro gas uh, the, the power plant the hydraulic hydro plant but I told him if a person is a murderer and Stalin is a murderer period so and no other actions can be justified and thank God he understood that he's a smart boy and he's about to turn 16. He is able to think. So this draft involves more and more people into this circle of murderers. And one day these people will return to Russia. What kind of Russia it will be? Well, I think it, those wackos will be even more horrifying than uh, those men uh, uh, that came back from the Afghan war. Or like these paratroopers day guys who were breaking bricks with their head. So now these guys uh, who were sitting in prison, uh, doing time in prison for what they did, now they're decorated and they'll come with this and they will have uh, this uh, psychological trauma. They're like those sharks uh, that tasted human blood and you can't stop them. You as a director, can you define at what point that the memory about the about World War II uh, became the driving force of uh, Russia's development in 21st century? Where was this click when this 20-year-old uh, and 30-year-old, when they think that as if they participated in that war? I'd say that this is the Immortal Regiment march, uh, this event. So the authorities, they realize that they can privatize the idea, they can own the idea, and then they used uh, this act to befool people, because, you know, people were caring 
uh, those portraits of those who died in the war without even knowing them. Now we live in 21st century and we are recalling what happened in 1945, but to, so what? We haven't done anything new since 1945, we did not do anything great in our country for all these years. Why that became the uh, foundation of all this? Because, you know, this glory, it doesn't belong to you, it doesn't belong to your grandfathers, it belongs to your great-grandfathers authorities, uh, they promised they're going to give apartments, new apartments to veterans of the war. But on TV, they showed when it was still possible, they showed where those veterans live, where they live in dilapidated houses, uh, and no heating and no running water. And they were still promised that they're going to get those apartments. But the authorities were kind of hoping that those veterans will die sooner and they save on them. And many veterans died without getting anything. And no apartment, no heating, no nothing. And you see, these things, they don't go together. Being proud of the victory and a complete contempt to the veterans. Absolutely inhuman treatment of those veterans. And I remember that my aunt, uh, she was one of those workers, she worked on this radio car, and this radio car was driven uh, to the front line, and first they played Solveig song, and then she had this announcement to the German troops that they need to surrender. And uh, uh, my mother-in-law was doing that, and then till 1944 they were not listening to my mother-in-law. And several times they hit that car. Uh, when she finished her announcement, immediately uh, the Germans started shooting at that car, uh, and she was wounded, and she was buried under the rubble. Uh, and uh, incidentally, she was dug out by the Russians. And on the victory day, on May 9th, after the war, uh, from uh, the Communist Party office, uh, they brought her as a present to sneakers bars and I think a roll of uh, toilet paper. This is how they greeted the veterans. I think that this is the soullessness. And this dehumanization kind of starts up there in the government. Why they have this uh, United People's Front? Who came up with this idea? Surkov, this ideologist of uh, the Ukrainian war. So, so what does it mean, so-called deep nation, uh, who are living deep in asshole? So what kind of thing is that? All this I'd call it uh, like word juggling. But people like it, you know. Yes, they, they want it to have this strong hand. And then, yes, they have this enforcement to peace, restoration of constitutional regime, this is Chechnya, Georgia. Here they call it special military operation of denazification. So they were ready for this draft 10 years ago, but you know the, the draft just happened today. These people were befooled. They were prepared for that. So they are now a cannon fodder. How did it happen that the country, which experienced all the atrocities of KGB and KVD, MGB, they elected a KGB officer to be their president, which means uh, they don't care about their past, about all people who were tormented and tortured in prisons, how it's possible to forgive that. But they're still the same, those uh, successors of KGB. Uh, they are with this cold head and hot heart, as they say, and with their and the blood up to their arms. But see, uh, don't you think that uh, Russian women uh, will be without men? What men? Without these drunkards? Without these fools? 
It's like an artificial selection, and I think it will require a lot of work to restore everything here. When I see what entertainment they have here, and I look at it, and I can't believe it's happening in my country. There is a war in my country, people die on both sides. And of course, I feel particularly sorry for Ukrainians, but I also feel sorry for these guys who are dying for nothing. The Ukrainians know what they're dying for, they're dying for their land. But these guys, what are they dying for? What do you think uh, the less uh, scary way out of it? I think it's change of the authorities, change of power. Somebody on the level of our president or on, his, on, on that level of power, if they understand that the, something should be restored, something and in fact, if you look, who are the friends of Russia now, today? Actually, you have to have an A in geography in order to find those countries on the globe who are our friends. I'd say that somebody who will come after this president, he will realize that something must be done in order to restore international connections. I would say this person will be forced to make certain steps to return to the international community. Who is going to be? I have no idea. But about the people as general, I don't think it's going to happen soon. Look at the Germans. It took them 30 years to get rid of this guilt complex, Be and they had this uh, old German atonement, going to restore their human consciousness, to realize that they did something horrible, that they are responsible for what happened. There is no any other way. And one screenwriter called me up, and you know him, and he said to me, are they crazy there in Europe? They don't let our artists to come to Europe. And I said to him, Listen, we are responsible. We brought death to another country, to a sovereign country. Why are they supposed to welcome us there? Did you vote for this president? And he says, yes. Yes, he's a strong president. And I said, okay, fine. So now it's a payoff. And then he said to me, oh, you're a Bolshevik. And I said, I never was one. And he seemed to be a smart guy. He's from Kharkov, from Ukraine himself. It's a catastrophe, just catastrophe. What part of your life you would call the happiest one? It's my years in the Moscow Theatre School. It's from 1964 to 1968. It was like a, a lyceum uh, where Pushkin studied. You had like a crazy class, right? Well, the previous class was pretty crazy. It was uh, Nikolai Karachins of uh, movie star was there. But we were, you know, the year after them, we had uh, Garik Leontiev, Alexander Pashutin. Actually, Alexander Pashutin uh, is pro this uh, military operation. But I told him what I think about it with all his talks on TV, and he stopped coming to TV. There was a great atmosphere uh, in the Moscow Theatre School, and they loved us. And it's a rare thing in school and in, in, in university when teachers love you like this, because usually they pressure students. But there they loved us because we were. And Pavel Masalsky, our master teacher, he used to say to us, you succeeded for yourself very much. And see, he said that to future actors who are going to be working not for themselves, but for the audience. Don't you regret that you didn't become an actor? No, I don't. To some degree, I continued it, but in the puppets. And in fact, uh, I preach that in my animation films, even in you know, matches, paper and wire that I use. But life of human spirit is the main foundation. That's why I would say all Stanislavski's 
commandments are there, so I use them. A grey wolf and a little red riding hood. You're well known in Europe and you could leave. Why don't you leave? Okay. My wife is not yeah. here, right? Yes, yeah, she's not here. She can't hear you. Uh, she always rebukes me for that. Uh, we could leave. And I was offered. It was 1992. It was a phenomenal success of uh, this uh, film, A Grey Wolf and the Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, and after I got the Golden Palm in Cannes, I was invited by the president of the Disney Studios. Uh, they invited me there to have a workshop. And it was 1992, empty shelves in the stores, there were only mustards, horseradish and birch tree juice, but what about the cans, the fish cans uh, in tomato sauce? Uh, I'm from Rostov, we had that there. Well, we didn't. So anyway, I'm going to Los Angeles and I'm bringing nine boxes with film with me without knowing that in the studio they had five films, my films, in the studio. They knew my work. So I come there, I make my presentation, but this capitalist system, it was a really speed-up system. I had my workshop not in the evening when they go home and not in the morning when they work, but I had it during the lunch time. That's why they brought their lunch boxes for the workshop, and while eating their lunch, they were listening to me, and sometimes chewing, they were asking their questions. But I was okay with this. So, and three days we had this chewing workshop. Then after that, the president of the studio told me, I offer you to stay. I said, in, what do you mean? To stay here forever. But I already created my studio in Moscow. I had five people, five employees who were making uh, the grey wolf with me and they went with me and they believed me, they believed that I will lead them out of Egypt, so to speak. Well, at least they will make living, you know, working with me. Maybe my energy or whatever, they believed in me. And he didn't, uh, the president didn't offer it to them, he offered it only to me. I said to him, I can't do this. And he said, you're a businessman. I said, I'm a director. So what, do you, what am I supposed to do? Uh, what do you offer me to do? And he said, you will do serious. And he showed me kind of like waved his hand like that saying, uh, lifelong project. And then he said, I said, no. And then he said, how many people you have in your family? You, I have three. You will have three cars, house, and a salary that nobody has in Russia. And at that point, I always say, my mistake was not that I turned it down, but my mistake was that I told about this conversation to my wife. And then she told me who I am. But I don't regret. See, I lived here all my life. More or less, I know these people. I know their psychology. I know all their bad and good qualities. So I returned. And since uh, 1992, I made a lot of movie, uh, films and uh, the ones I wanted, and nobody imposed them on me. It was my will, my scripts, my thoughts, and I was sharing all this with the audience, things that I, I was concerned about. Usually, my grandson, he actually criticizes me for that a lot, and he says, Grandpa, 
you can do really cool cartoons. Why are you doing all this political stuff? But I said to him, I, I can't help it, because I am concerned with what I am concerned, and I speak about it. To work for a year or a year and a half just uh, for the sake of someone having a good laugh, no, it's not my thing. Yes, at some point I did uh, the flying ship, but now not. And I can see uh, this evolution in uh, many actors and artists. Oleg Borisov, great actor, he played in uh, the movie Chasing Two Bunnies, and it was like fireworks, this film. But at the end of his life, he was a very somber man. He becomes different, and that's okay. The time has control over us, and we can't perceive life as we perceived it when we were 16 or 20, when every day was a gift. No, you wake up every morning with concerns, with heavy thoughts, you run to the computer to look up what's going on, how things are. I read what Roman Balayan, uh, director and the screenwriter, uh, great director, and he kind of had the same thing. And I asked him, so what's going on with you? And he said to me, I'm living uh, in the internet. I can't unglue myself from it. And he lives in Kiev. So it turns out that they stole our life, right? Yep. The ugly duckling. Ваши картины и гадкие ученые. Your films, such as uh, The Ugly Duckling, Adagio, Balero, these are films that show that crowd, mediocrity, wins over light and good. What do you think is happening now? Are we witnessing victory? of evil over good. No, I'm sincere in my films, and what I'm saying that minority is usually right, not the majority. And when they listen to the opinion of minority, then you have a civilization. It's democracy. It's okay. When majority rules, it doesn't determine anything, and these words that people are always right, it's not. But what about those people that were breaking churches and destroying bell towers and those who were snitching? Were they right? No. Everything is determined by this thin layer that irritates people. And, you know, they put this thin layer, these people of thin layer, on the philosophical ships and send them away. And they do it because these people. Uh, these intellectuals, uh, they doubt about everything, and they criticize things, and they irritate uh, other people because they don't think the same way. Balero. What do you think about your colleagues uh, who were quite liberal during perestroika and spoke up and now they are silent or support uh, the authorities? I, break, I broke all connections with them. I can't talk to them. Uh, to me, the person who supports this, 
They're criminals. But some people can explain that. Some, some are trying to uh, protect their theater or making movies. But what about uh, saving your conscience? But what's what more important? Eulogy is more important. It's very important that always you tell yourself what my son speak of me. Because I do determine something for my son and my grandson, because they orient on me. I have to be up to the mark. I cannot disgrace my name, because it will be passed on my son and on my grandson. How are they going to live on if my reputation is tainted? People are going to say, oh, this is son of this and that. No, it can be like that. Children should be proud of their parents. And otherwise, this fear that is penetrating all people, this is fear of the last century or it's not is a genetic feeling i think it's genetic feeling they kind of believe that uh, their master or land owner will figure it out for people uh, the need for the strong hand and back in the 90s uh, 1960s and 70s, uh, in the 1980s, uh, there was a protest against the Soviet power when they were putting these stickers of Stalin portrait on their windshields, and then it became more and more and more, and people wanted to have this strong hand, and they wanted to be chastised. And this is incomprehensible to me. In other words, uh, people did not go through that pass, they did not shake off this serfdom. It's still in us. Was there a point when you believed in a beautiful future for Russia? Yes. When in 1989 I was right in the middle of this crowd, of these people, but I don't like to be in the crowd, uh, I was always an outsider, but I liked it, I liked to be in it, I liked this community, I liked to be in this company, I liked that uh, Lev Panamarev, a uh, human rights activist, was right next to me and somebody else was marching next to me and many people whom I admired were around me and it was this euphoria that everything is possible we will go through anything but what happened in 1990s that things turned out to be reversible that all those achievements of democracy faded very quickly the thing is that it's like in this fable uh, the fox and the grapes when we were trying to get to democracy and then we tried it and then we said well you know the grapes are sour and we refused it. But we never had democracy, because all this privatization and all those loans for shares auctions, everything that was poured on these poor Soviet people, all these unfamiliar words, nobody knew what it was. And when all that kind of avalanched the people, uh, it turned out the people were not ready for that, they were not educated about it. And more than that, at some point there was a presentation of Igor Gaidar's book, uh, this economist who was a prime minister and reformer of uh, Russia in 1990s. So we get to know each other. And he asked me if I read his book, and I said yes. And then he asked about my opinion, and I said, you know, Igor, I have only one comment on the book, that our people are pretty simple. And they do perceive when they're talked to. He was supposed to do what Zelensky does today. He was supposed to talk to people, explain to what is done and what's to expect and uh, what difficulties are ahead of us. And then he said to me, yes, I understand. But he said he didn't have time for that. And then he said, I regret about it. And I felt this bitterness in his words that it didn't happen. I think if he managed to 
stay the Prime Minister and Yeltsin uh, managed to keep him, then things would be different, but it didn't happen. But what happened after uh, was a twist democracy. It wasn't democracy, and this democracy could be ruined very easily, and they did. What are you working on now? This is Schubert's Ave Maria with no vocals, just musical instruments. And it's not exactly a religious theme. I would say it's a theme of choice. I'm making it about myself to some degree. Because every person makes a choice in their life. Uh, they choose a path. And it's a matter of the moral code, of this moral imperative. And the person goes along this road, zigzagging or turning and making turns, or they are walking straight anyway, despite the fact that they know that ahead of them there is nothing good, but they already chosen and they go there despite anything. So, and that's the story that I'm going to tell, so no spoilers. Despite the fact that I love you very much. So, and what about the main character? Is it a match? A button? No, no. It's a baby. So I decided it's going to be a baby. It's a quite difficult uh, task, uh, and I would say it's probably the most difficult uh, film in my life, because I set the bar very high. Could you please choose mercy or justice? Yeah. I would say justice and mercy are, are the same, are equal. Mercy to the dead, but justice is very important to me, very important. Freedom or stability? Freedom. The truth or safety? The truth. At some point I said that a man looks beautiful when he speaks the truth. I saw people who spoke the truth, like Yuri Afanasyev, uh, our politician of the 90s, when he spoke about aggressively obedient majority. He was very beautiful. When a person makes an act, when despite the opinion of the majority being a minority, the person speaks the truth, and I think it's an act. Motherland or the truth? The truth. Yes, I'm a patriot. I love my country, but I don't like the authorities. And uh, there is a great difference between me and uh, those super patriots. I love my country. I love the cities of the country. I love the people. I traveled around a lot, and you interviewed Ekaterina Genieva. She was uh, my friend, uh, general director of uh, uh, Russian uh, Foreign Literature Library, and she took me around Russian cities, small cities, and with big libraries, small libraries. I was a sort of brand name uh, for this tour, and she would start every conference with my film Adagio, and two months before she died, she told me, do you know how many times I watched Adagio? She said, 88 times.
I saw these people and I love them. It's not like I dislike everybody. No, it's not like that. If it was like that, I would make my films. To make films for yourself is stupid. I love these people. In those small provincial towns, so they work for tiny pay there. And they serve, not work, they serve in libraries. They were bringing culture. The people with no arrogance, they don't have this uh, Moscovite arrogance. They watched my films, they asked great questions. They, they were listening to Ekaterina Genieva. Do you think about what she would have said today? I think she would have been with me, she would be uh, together with me. She would go for a compromise. She she used to do that, and she used to tell me about uh, the Minister of Culture, Medinsky, and she said, "Oh, Medinsky gets educated. She he learns." But I said to her, "You know, you're naive, Katerina. You're stupid for your age." But she said to me, "No, I'm serious. I took him around the library, and he was like, wow, wow, wow about it." But I said to her, "You know, I'm a bit older than you are." I'm very sorry that uh, they destroyed uh, the library that she created there, that uh, the library stopped being this magnet of culture uh, that she created. She was an incredibly creative, and I loved her a lot. She managed to build bridges between people, cities, countries. She was working on some absolutely amazing projects uh, that seemed to be impossible, but she managed to do them, she managed to implement them. This is her energy, and I'm just like that, with this energy. And I thought, how could I leave uh, Soyuz Multifilm Studio and to create my own studio without anything, uh, no equipment, no cameras, no nothing. But I just believe in myself and I believe in that everything will work out fine. And I did that, and now I'm running the studio for 31 years. Some people don't even live as long. Do you believe in afterlife? No. There is dust, decay, and the proof of that are the fallen leaves. And then next spring there is a resurrection, but it's a different generation without you. Are you afraid of death? No. No, I'm not. Maybe because I fulfilled my calling. Maybe I'll manage to, to make another film, which I'm not quite sure about, but, but I'm not afraid. I'm sorry to leave my family. That's very true. How are they going to do without me? But this idea of life making a circle uh, and life went in vain, are you tormented by that? Yes, I am. I read uh, Anatoly Bely's uh, article, and I like him a lot. And uh, I would be happy to have such a friend, and he's much younger than I am. Great actor. And this is what he said, that everything that I've done in my life, and what I've done in my life, it's, it's, it's been like 50 years I've been doing this, and it turned out that everything was in vain. That they celebrate ignorance. They don't want to know the history, the meaninglessness of their acts. This is what they celebrate today. Unfortunately, the majority that I don't like, they do that, and they're not my audience. Maybe some of them, they watched The Flying Ship, but they're not interested in the rest of my work. Uh, but what Anatoly Bely says, it tells us that the efforts were in vain. That we were trying to sow the good and the eternal, but what we reap today? What we are reaping. But then it means that art doesn't mean anything, doesn't change people. I mean, no books, uh, no education. Well, it turned out to be a manipulation of consciousness uh, with propaganda. Propaganda turned out to be higher than culture. 
It turned out this propaganda man Solovyov is kind of higher than Stanislavsky. So here is the trouble. This product turned out to be in more demand. Will Ukrainians forgive us? No. No. Several generations will remember that. Such things cannot be forgiven. Do you live with the feeling uh, that everything uh, uh, will go down through the drains? No, I, I'm trying to wave this thought away. I have grandchildren, they will live in this country. I still have some little hope. I do. When, where will we meet in a year? It would be great not to meet in a cemetery. What will you do when the war ends? I will have a drink. The Russian Ministry of Justice declared Katerina Gordeva a foreign agent. An old joke, a Soviet joke. An old Jew comes to the radio station to speak on air and he has so I'm going to be here and speak into the microphone okay okay get focused soon you will be on air but I have a question when I will be speaking into this microphone so everybody will hear me right everybody in our town yes you will be heard in our town but when I speak in the microphone, then they can even hear me in some other city, right? So, yes, if they tune up, they will. So, keep focused so soon. I'm very sorry. Another question. But if somebody there, we're there, over there, overseas, if they tune it up and, and somewhere in the United States, will they hear me? Well, if they tune it up, yes, they will hear you. Okay, fine. So, get focused, count down, and you'll start talking. Five. Four, three, three two, two, one. Help me!